Welcome to Right Stuff Radio, where we showcase Christian authors worldwide. Each week, join me for a new author and a great new book to add to your library. Welcome to this special edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we are going to be talking to my returning guest co-host and contributor, Alan Stedham. He is the author of my favorite series so far, which is the Jordan of Algorand series. You guys know how much I enjoyed that series, how much Alan made me so upset while I was reading those books. And he's going to be talking with us about something I think we really need to discuss. And we're going to be discussing the slippery slope of AI technology. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash write stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we covet your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net. Click on that pink follow button and you'll never, ever have to miss a show. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Alan on. Alan, how you doing? Doing pretty good, Parker. Good to talk to you again. And I'm always glad to talk to you. And I'm so thankful that you took time to be here with me as we talk about something that I think we need to raise the alarm about. And that is the slippery slope of AI technology. We all understand that technology is a good thing. We do use it. We do so many things with technology. And before we get into the slippery slope of technology and AI technology, let's go ahead and just show some positives first. But before I do that, go ahead, reintroduce yourself to our listeners who may not know you. My name is Alan Stedham. I'm a Christian fiction author with Ambassador International. That's my publisher. And I'm married, interracially married, and we have three children, two sons and a daughter, and live in Texas. Been published author since 2019, done a lot of cross-genre fiction stuff, and I'm always writing, it seems like. So, But it's what I have a passion for. The Lord gave it to me, and I try to use it to honor Him. And you do very well doing that, Alan. You know, I'm one of your biggest fans. I do enjoy your writing. I know you're working on something we'll talk about later on in the broadcast, but this topic is one I think we are really interested in discussing because we need to sound the alarm or the herald for our Christian brothers and sisters to be aware that there is a slippery slope when it comes to AI technology. Now, before I began our conversation, I did say technology has a lot of positive influences. And go ahead, just list what some of those positive influences are. Well, I mean, just the fact that we're able to, you know, record this show right now, we're using technology to do it. We're using the internet. We're using computers. There's a lot of things out there, different softwares that allowed people to stay in touch, say, during the pandemic. Whereas for in times past, we would have been isolated and alone completely and had to deal with that. So, I mean, there are benefits to it. Technology has allowed medicines to be created. It has uh, allowed people to understand our world and our universe better. So like say, for instance, you know, the James Webb Telescope and Hubble before that and the different uh, satellites that we have have all brought about technological advancement. And there are uh, computers and machines that help out with medical issues and have even led to a lot of improvements. So technology, I look at technology as a tool. And like any tool, it can be used to benefit people and it can also be abused. So in terms of there are, there's a lot of good uses for technology. So like you, I'm not against technology. I do agree that there are things that we need to be educated about and that we need to be aware of to avoid, if possible, you know, going down the slippery slope. 
technology. I will also add to underpin what you said is that God created man to be stewards of his creation. Technology allows us to do that. And we can go as simple as farming. If you want to farm the land, instead of going digging down into the earth and pulling up the weeds or pulling up the produce that we build, we use technology to plow the fields, to gather the fields, water it, everything. So God made us to be stewards. And we're doing that with technology. And that's okay. You mentioned the various telescopes and satellites. We can even talk about the different spacecraft that have gone over to Mars and we get these lovely pictures of this barren world. We take readings from Pluto to 7 million miles away to test our first planetary defense system. So this is great stuff. This is the stuff that science fiction is made out of. And it is so exciting to see what we can do because God gave us this insatiable curiosity to probe the creation that he made us stewards of. And I think that's something to be happy about. But along with the positives, we have to ask ourselves various questions. Is AI technology, it's faster, but is it better? Let's go ahead and delve into that part of the discussion. Yeah, I think that. It's interesting because, again, a artificial intelligence is another tool. It's software-based, and it has to be programmed by people. So that makes an interesting dynamic there. In the end, no matter how sophisticated the program, no matter how well it's programmed, and no matter uh, how much it achieves its goals of seeking to improve itself and learn from the input that it receives, whether it's human input or data or art even, and how it interprets that or reinterprets that, which is what a lot is very much a trend right now of AI generated art, for example, it can only take what it's been given and then crank something out to the best of the ability it's been programmed. It is faster. It may even be prettier. In some instances, it may be extraordinary to look at. Is it better than people and what people can do? No, because artificial intelligence software is limited. It can only do what it's been designed to do and no more. People are limitless because people get inspiration. People have passion and that passion drives their art or their literature or their songs or whatever form of creativity they choose to manifest. And because we were given our creativity by God, there is no limit to it because God can always give us more. We cannot give AI more. We can give it a software update. We can tell it a few more things to do. We can increase its capacity, but we cannot make it more than it is. We cannot give it human inspiration. We cannot give it human drive or human desire. It can only imitate. It cannot create in and of itself. It can basically randomize. It can pull elements together and call it a finished piece of art, and it may be beautiful. But it didn't create it. It pulled the bits together and spat something out and hopes, you know, and whoever makes it hopes it's good. I want to simmer on this for one second, Alan, because you said something I think is quite profound. People are limitless. We get inspiration. It allows me to talk about art. Art is the expression of the soul. Art allows us to take whatever thoughts and emotions and I are inside of us and put it in a medium that we can share with others. You also said that we are created by God who gave us the creativity. We are continually inspired by that. Now, I want to take some examples from pop culture because you said that AI can only imitate. And some examples of that would be from the Star Trek franchise, which me and you are both very much well acquainted with. I was also thinking about the android in the reboot of the Alien franchise, David. I don't know if you saw that movie, 
But in the movie, he is very confused that he cannot create because his creator did not give him the ability to create. And when they were going into the origin story of how the alien came to be, which I hate it, by the way, they had it to where David created the aliens because he found some black goo on the progenitor's planet. He put it inside of Elizabeth, who's a character in the movie. And then in the second movie, which is Alien Covenant, he allows life to bloom and to create. So this is him loving creation because as an android with his creator before Wayland died, he could not do that. So he doesn't care what the ramifications of this creation are. He just wants to create. It reminds me also of Blade Runner. In Blade Runner, you had the androids that were, they had a limited life. They could only live for so long. And the Bucker Hauer character in the movie was so upset that he killed his creator when his creator couldn't extend his life. But his creator said something profound, which he reminded him of the old adage, the candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And that was his analogy for his creation, that he was extraordinary, but limited. And I thought that was very interesting, that to me, it sums up the whole thing. You can make an artificial creation. You can make a robot. You could even potentially make an android, but it's going to be limited. It's not going to exceed its programming. It's not going to exceed its capabilities. Because it's not alive. It's not a human being. And human beings always remember how unique we are. And we are unique because we were created to be unique. That brings me to my next question I want us to delve into. You were talking about the AI-generated art that's been going around recently. And they are really fun to play around with. You can simply put in a few commands and you come up with its interpretation of what that command is. I recently used it, Alan, to just see and play around with it like many others are. And I said, a Victorian lady with her hands clapped together. And when you see the output that this machine came up with, it was horrifying because she looks regular, but her hands look like an amalgamation of Freddy Krueger and Edward Sister hands. And it gives you the stuff that nightmares are made out of. AI can only go so far. Oh, another example of it, not the art, but people have been like feeding all of the movies and the animated series of Batman in or Spider-Man in to give the raw info to an AI to write either a comic book script or a television or a movie script. And the results are ridiculous. Because the AI can take in all that information. It can even see the way sentences are formulated, just like predictive text works. And But it's as bad as predictive text because it'll predict the wrong thing. So you can give it all of the data. It's not going to write a better story than a passionate writer. You know, it will give you a bunch of, it may be funny to read. It may be amusing or interesting. But A, it's not going to make a lot of sense. And B, even if it makes sense, it's going to be bland and basically a skeleton of what you would normally have because it doesn't have actual creativity. It has what it's been programmed to do. You've given it, let's say, a whole season of Game of Thrones. You're not going to get George R.R. R. Martin back. You're going to get something funky. Creativity with us as human beings is wrapped up in our experiences. The question is, will humanity continue to create with our own hands or are we going to be fully reliant on AI to do it? Because it can do it, as you said earlier, faster. Right. I'll tell you why that won't happen, in my opinion. There will be a certain percentage of the population that will rely on it because there's always been, to be blunt, there's always been lazy creators. There's always been people that don't want to do the work. And so, and there's got to be people who rely on technology because they love technology and that's why they rely on it. But you will never take creativity out 
of the creator. I don't know about you, but I have to write. It's just in me. It has to come out. Artists have to draw or paint or use the computer to digitally manifest. That creativity is going to come out. It's got to. Or the creator suffers as a result of that by not creating. That brings back to another point, which is that all of this search for knowledge by humanity, all of this urge to create, I believe that it is all to connect us back to God. It's all to point us towards our creator because he's made this magnificent universe that we live in. There may be all kinds of problems on the earth, but how do we escape those problems temporarily? We create things. We use entertainment. We have that within us to keep us from being overwhelmed by all the bad. And so, you know, even if the whole world goes a certain way, there's always going to be a percentage of people that have to create. And no matter what it is that they're creating, whether they're Christians, whether they're not Christians, whatever, there's always going to be creatives in this world because God made us to be creatives. And anyone who doesn't do it is denying themselves the wrong way. It also means that creation is a form of rebellion against not being creative. If you think about Satan and when the Lord cast him out of heaven, Satan used to create music and he can't anymore. Isn't it interesting that a lot of music, which has such a profound effect on the soul, is something that he can attack? I wouldn't say that Satan can't create music. He can influence music, and he does all the time. Just because he was cast out of heaven, he's not creating music in heaven for sure. He's consigned to the pits of hell. But his spirit comes up and influences the world and tempts people and gives people evil inspiration, dark inspiration. So in that regard, he's the opposite of God in that he inspires bad things and he stimulates evil imaginations, imaginations against God because he's against God. So it's We've got to be careful in, in how we, we view it. I, I don't disagree with some of your points, but I think that creation by individuals depends on where the inspiration comes from, but we still have the desire to create. I don't think it's rebelling against the creator unless that's its deliberate purpose by the creator of that particular form of art. That's a valid point, and I agree with you there. And it's See, we're going to do something that's old-fashioned, Alan. We're going to dialogue about different points of view. <laughs> it's totally okay. <laughs> but I was thinking about what you said. Even demonic entities are alive, not necessarily in the human sense, but they exist where AI is a tool and technology is a tool. It does is not embedded with life. Because they were created by God. So it's our creation, though. God gives us that awesome responsibility and ability to use creativity. And it also depends on what your definition of creativity is. We have been talking because we are writers in the artistic expression. But I'm going to broaden that out so people who may feel as if I'm not artistically inclined can understand. I'm going to use Alan Arnold's definition where creation is the ability to influence the area around you. So you can be a homemaker, you can be a janitor, you can be a CEO of a company and create that atmosphere. So I'm just going to broaden that definition, even though we are limiting it to artistic expression right now. So I think we tapped that topic and I want to go to the next one because the next question then becomes, how does AI technology have a negative impact on social interactions? And I'm going to preface this real quick, Alan, and you can come on board. People need people. We need people for many different reasons. Even villains need people. Friends need people. People who are crazy need people. <laughs> I mean, people need people. Arguably, you could say sociopaths don't, but, you know, that's a nitpick. Yeah. Well, sociopaths do, because who are they going to manipulate if you don't have people there? See, that's what I mean. Like, people need people. I'm not saying it's always for good reasons, <laughs> you know? <laughs> The fine line I'm going down. <laughs> but people need people. And 
with what we're seeing now and what we saw this really exasperated during the pandemic is the isolation. And when our only form of connection or one of our limited forms of connections became technology only. And that helped to create a sense of community. I'm not saying that sense of community is false, but it has had a negative impact on social interaction. I think that it was harmful in that those people who may have already been leaning introvert became more introverted or had more difficulty uh, reassimilating back into a social environment afterwards. Uh, we saw for a fact that mental health was negatively impacted by the isolation of the lockdowns. We saw suicides go through the roof compared to what they had been prior to the lockdown. And that was just tragic. And and some of that is still continuing because some people have not fully come out of the lockdown stage, even if their city or state has. Some people, I think, are still locked down mentally. And it's profound. Uh, They have also proven that children's education was harmed by the lockdowns and the isolation. Certainly the social interactions were affected. Uh, Children between children and, you know, dealing with the masks, no matter how you feel about them, it has psychological impacts that can be measured and have been started to be measured since it's been two years. So that's one side to it. It's an interesting you bring up about people needing uh, interaction. What is your interaction when you're interacting with bots on the internet? Because those aren't real people, but they can influence your opinion. They imitate and can create a false picture of all these people believe X, Y, Z when they don't. So you believe that the majority of people believe X, Y, Z because that's all you've seen. And they were talking about how the impact of these bots can help continue to fuel dissension between people because they're just spouting out information. Now, I know for a fact that Google was training the Google AI to not be biased on certain things. But at the same time, you really can't because the creators are going to put their own bias (laughs) in that creation. Just like if I were going to create a, I don't know, what's a Christian AI? I can't think of any Christian AI right now. You know, I'm trying to tell it, but you know, if I was going to create something that has strong religious connotations with it, I'm going to probably put possibly a Baptist foundation in it because I grew up Baptist, for example. So no one's drinking. It could be simpler than that, though. The funny thing that I could imagine of a Christian programmed artificial intelligence would be an AI can't interpret scripture. An AI can't understand. It can only spout out what's been given to it. You can give it the whole Bible, whatever translation or however many translations you want. So what happens if... You're talking to, let's say, instead of Siri, it's Jacob. Okay, so you're talking to Jacob, the AI, and you're saying, okay, Jacob, I want a scripture that'll lift me up. And it gives you a scripture about a ladder. My gosh. (laughs) You know, it gives you a scripture about this historical event that has nothing to do, and it doesn't even lift you up because there's so many tragedies that happen, particularly in the Old Testament. And it's like, it's just going to spout the closest thing to a keyword, because that's what it's been programmed to do. It's going to find something that has that word or something that's as close as it can find a synonym to that word. It's not going to be like your pastor who'd be like, okay, let's turn to the book of Job. Okay, let's, Job went through all these things in verses X, Y, Z, but God brought him out of it and God restored to him more than he had. That's uplifting. If we continue to rely on AI to create for us without understanding our limitless potential in because God, who is limitless in his abilities and in his attributes of creativity, will human creators become obsolete? Never. And I'll tell you why. Because like we mentioned before, you can improve the technology and you can tell creators not to create doesn't mean they're not going to. They're going to have to. It's just something within us. Now, they may change the medium that they create in. Let's say if all the paper in the world went away, you still got tablets, you've still got computers, you still got X, you know, these different things. God finds a way. God knows everything and God inspires us 
to do a lot of things and especially creativity. And I'll even just take Christian creators for right now, because this is something I I relate to very much. God will give you stuff you don't expect, and it's all for his glory. You'll do something and you're like, God says, do this. You know, I want you to write about this. Or you just, you have to do this piece of art. You have to write these lyrics. But then it turns around and you make this song and you perform at your church or you perform in public. This song that praises God and it's got this really moving story. And you reach people for God. That was the goal. God uses creativity. That's what people don't see. and so. God can't use a computer. He can use computer programmers. He can use the people who build the computers. He can build someone. He can influence someone to use a creator to do something for his glory. But the computer itself is an object. The software within it is may as well be inert matter as far as he's concerned. Because God is about people. And his, I mean, he's the original creator. And he put part of himself in us, in our souls. So we have to create. You can name an artist in a heartbeat that did stuff. It's like, how did they do that? Where did they get that perspective? It doesn't matter what form of art it was. It's extraordinary. And that has to be recognized. And in that creativity, especially if it's positive, but even if it's negative, if they're telling a story and that story, grabs you and you just can't help but be in awe of it is because of that spark of creativity that comes from God himself. And God wants to be recognized. Even if people don't acknowledge God, they'll acknowledge the creativity. They don't even know what they're praising. That's my opinion. I think it's a good, well-informed opinion. And I think as we discuss this, I hope our listeners, if you want us to have a part two to this, to this discussion, just let us know, because we definitely will, because we're really just scratching the surface of this. And I think that this topic is important because we as believers need to be aware of what's going on in our world. You can't be so holy that we're no earthly good. Now, I'm raising to my final question, and this is often something that happens in movies where you have a situation where apocalypse has happened. Where would AI technology be in an apocalyptic viewpoint where there are no more human creators or human operators? What would happen with AI? It's interesting. I just thought of something. There was a game on Steam that kind of explored this called Stray. And it's about a cat that finds its way into an underground city. And this city is entirely populated by robots. These robots were originally created to be the servants of people. But those people all relocated to this giant city because there was a devastation on Earth, basically a plague. And they all died out. All the people died out eventually within like 100 years of after they went and enclosed themselves in this city. And so all that was left was the robots. And the robots could only do what they were programmed to do. Some were servants, some were bartenders, some were all these different things. And in the game, they took it a little step further, which I thought was amusing, was that the, the robots actually started imitating family life. In that you had robots with fathers and sons and mothers, but obviously they did not have children, but they designated robots as their offspring. And but all they could do was imitate. And it it summed it up perfectly that you can only make the creation so good, but if it isn't alive, it can't do more than it was programmed to do. There was a lot more to it, but but it was an interesting example to me of what might happen if that were to, you would just basically have robots would either be in, would essentially either be just servile roles to each other or to nothing. I mean, in the game, there were some robots that just stood around because they didn't have people to serve anymore. It would be like that. 
they don't have that spark of creativity. They don't have that true capacity to adapt. They will always be limited by their programming and they will eventually cease to exist because they cannot create anything new. They can make copies of themselves and those copies can go on for however long their parts can be repaired, things like that, but they would never thrive. They would never go beyond what they were designed to do. And so you would essentially have a planet occupied by machines to whatever degree until nature destroyed them. And that brings me to a couple of points I want to make, because I'm going to just go to some news that really was very titillating when it was really hot off the press, was the software engineer who claimed that Google had created an AI bot that was sentient. And I don't know if you saw the conversation he posted. It was very interesting. But several people who are programmers said it's a really good program. It's just doing what it was programmed to do, which is to imitate human conversation and thought. That's what it was doing. He was like, no, it's sentient, it's sentient. They're like, that's great programming. Here's the problem. One, that's a, a case of the, the IT guy who got too close to his program. A software program cannot be sentient. As much as I love the character data in Star Trek, but that's fiction for a very good reason. Data could never actually be truly sentient, much as we might want him to be. He might even be so good as that software program as to imitate, but you can't, only God can give life. I think that's what it comes down to. And people want to believe so bad that man gets the credit, that humankind gets the credit for creation, but humankind couldn't do it if God hadn't created humankind with the capacity to reproduce, for example. And man can create because God gave him that. But humankind cannot make a robot alive. They cannot make an artificial intelligence sentient. They can only make it as good as their creativity allows, but it's not alive. And that's the distinction. Just like man wants to find life on other worlds, but life was made unique on this one. There may be other forms of life out there, but it won't be humankind. It might be microbial. It might be something we don't even comprehend. But God has a special purpose in making humankind. And it's because he made humankind to worship him. Whether they do or not, we all have the capacity. We all seek something that is God. It's just that some people choose to make something else a God or themselves God, but only God is God. And in the end, we answer to God. And that brings me to my final point, because this has been a wonderful conversation, just wonderful delving into this. And it's something that's going to make some people, and I say that because we do understand the human condition, which is extremely flawed, but God came to save us from that flawedness. And that's what the gospel message is about. But if we're going to put it into perspective, God created man to worship and commune with him, to serve him. But he also gave us that thing, that different thing, the soul, the creativity, all of that mimics his communicable attributes that he gave to us. And in that same regard, technology is created to serve man. And that's going to make some people uncomfortable because we, on one hand, we want to see ourselves as king of our universe when we want things to go our way, but we don't want to acknowledge that God created us to be stewards of creation and to use tools to do what we're supposed to do. If a robot doesn't have a function, what does it do? It is created to serve its creator. It's created to serve man. When you take artificial intelligence and robot and technology and you elevate them above the creator, you have a creation that does not have any latch to what it's supposed to do. It does not have its command. It is comfortable being a tool. Just like we have our pets, our pets are pets, right? We love them to death. We don't try to abuse them or anything like that, but they're quite content being a pet. 
I'm not going to have a pet tiger. I'm not crazy. You know, <laughs> you know, let's not be stupid. OK, but even in that stewardship, we're supposed to take care of God's creation. Think of this, Parker. Even if you had, even if you designed, if a person or a company designed robots or artificial intelligence machines to be able to, let's just say, let's be ridiculous, to basically be Terminator-like machines where they could, they could, but uh, let's say they even, they did the Arnold Schwarzenegger, they look human, but underneath their machine, whatever. But in the end, all they could do is infuse it with their own impulses. And so what happens then? Okay, let's say that the robots rise up, supposedly, according to their programming, and they enslave humanity. They're just doing what man programmed them to do. They're acting like man at that point because they can only do what they're programmed to do. Man imitates God. Machine imitates man. And that is something that we need to take with us as we get to end our conversation today, is that we're stewards of God's creation, and technology is our tool to do that. And we need to be able to hone our technology so we don't forget our purpose in being creators, that we have this wide universe, the world, ourselves, our bodies, so many things we create, vaccines, technology, farming, terraforming, gathering data, all these other things that we do with creation. We do all that because we have been given the ability and the responsibility to do that. And so we're going to use technology. We have to put technology in its proper place that it is supposed to serve us. It does not command us. We want it to be faster so we can do what we need to do, but we don't want it to overtake us. We want to have the respect for it that we have, but we also need to think we are limitless because we were created by our creator. So, Alan, thank you so much for being with me on the show today. Where can people connect with you? So my website is uh, alanstedham.com, A-L-L-E-N-S-T-E-A-D-H-A-M.com. That has all my social media on it. I am on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, a lot. I have a YouTube channel. You're welcome to check out my YouTube channel. The link is there. And you can search by my name, Alan Stedham. And it's been a pleasure, Parker. I really enjoyed the conversation. I really enjoyed it, too, and I know our listeners enjoyed it as well. If you have thoughts about what we're talking about, we'd love to hear them. You can always contact me at my website, and you can always contact Alan, too. We love this type of stuff. Maybe you disagree. We'd like to hear that, too. So make sure you let us know what you think by sending me an email or hitting us on Twitter at Parker J. Cole. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for joining me for this special edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the queen, Parker J., and you have a wonderful absolutely glorious, blessed day.